Hi everyone, welcome to week 11, chapter 11. This week we move on to East Asia, uh, centered on or dominated by China. Uh, of course, we're looking at the uh, Google Earth view of the region. You really have to still focus on that wheel that we talked about in previous lessons. Uh, sort of the Himalayan wheel with spokes into South China, Southwest China, Central Asia, I mean, South Asia, rather Southwest Asia, Central Asia, Russia. And today we're looking into East Asia dominated by China, but you can't really take countries in the region like South Korea, Japan, Taiwan lightly. They are significant players in the region. Unfortunately or fortunately, however you view it, China is the dominant player. So a few things about the region from the Google Earth perspective. It is tectonically active, whether you're looking at the boundary right here in the Himalayas. Uh, lots of earthquakes are often felt in South China. So the, uh, these provinces down here in China, of course, in the Tibetan region, the Tibetan plateau, it is seismically active as well. There are no volcanoes here. Uh, it is mostly a uh, seismic activity. And this is remember still a growing mountain chain. Uh, when you look at the east portion of the region, specifically Taiwan, in Japan, Japan is the intersection of three plate boundaries, Eurasia, Philippine, and the North American or the Pacific plate rather. So there you have this, these very significant trenches along the east coast of Japan, the island of Hokkaido, Honshu, here would be Tokyo. Uh, you have three significant plates and not surprisingly, Japan has been home to earthquakes in the eight or higher Richter scale throughout its history. Uh, I mean, the word tsunami is a Japanese term for harbor wave. Uh, and in 2011, Sendai or the Todoku, uh, Tohoku rather, um, earthquake and tsunami did unbelievable amount of damage uh, in the region, uh, 25,000 plus deaths. And this is an area that is as well prepared to deal with uh, tsunamis and earthquake as really anywhere else in the planet. So that would be the, the issue there. You have mountains like Mount Fuji, very sort of iconic volcanoes were found in the region. And then, of course, you have the Koreas, north and south. Uh, of course, you know, you couldn't get any more stark differences between two places. When you think about South Korea, you think about Seoul, you think about uh, K-pop, very popular right now. You think about brands like Samsung, you may have one of their phones. You may drive a car like a Kia or... Um, Hyundai, uh, Kyocera, other TV brands, you may have a LG, any of these brands, these are South Korean brands, uh, fighting and competing along the side of Toyota, Nissan, um, Subaru, so Japanese brand, so lots, this is a very, very vigorous area of the world in terms of economic uh, might. Okay, and then, of course, you have in North Korea and South Korea, the demilitarized zone separating North from South and then North Korea couldn't be any more different than South Korea. Uh, North Korea shares its border with mostly China. However, a little tiny bit of their border is with Russia right there on the extreme northeast end. There are still volcanoes, for example, this volcano at the border of North Korea and China. And then, of course, you get to um, the further you go, you get into 
sort of like the capital district of China towards Beijing. And Beijing sort of sits in an area that is climatically on the cusp of being dry. So on the other side, you get into the Gobi Desert. And if you go further west, you get into the Tibetan Plateau and the Taklamakan Desert, which we talked about in these far western provinces of China. Of course, China being the most populated country in the world right now at 1.35 or so billion people has issues with water. It has issues with development. It has issues of culture and politics, like what's going on in Hong Kong. Uh, what's going on with the tensions with Taiwan. Okay, so that's problematic. From a land perspective, the Himalayas form the initial starting point for many of the rivers like the Yangtze and the Yellow Rivers. So China is a very wet, eastern side of it is wet, the western half of China is much drier and therefore much more water stressed and least populated. So the majority of people in China live here in this region, this part of China. Uh, it's impossible, you know, China will become the world's most dominant economy in roughly between 10 and 15 years. Some people think less, some people think a little bit more. Uh, and as a result, you know, it's a country that has to be dealt with whether we want to or not, uh, just like they have to deal with us whether they want to or not. And by us, I mean the United States, but there's also Europe and Russia and all those other partners uh, with the region. When we talk about South China, or I'm sorry, South Asia, I keep saying that, next class we'll be dealing with India as the dominant country in that particular region. So that is sort of the geography of it. Just by looking at the colors, you can see where it is dry versus where it is typically wet. Uh, obviously, this plateau sits at around 15,000 feet elevation. Um, and so it is different from a physical geography point of view, but it's also very different politically and very different culturally. The people in Tibet are not Han Chinese like the majority of China is. So they sound different and they look different. Uh, and they don't really consider themselves Chinese, even though technically it is part of the People's Republic of China. Uh, they consider themselves Tibetan. So there are similarities in terms of culture, some and religion, but it makes it really complicated, a very complicated region. So let's move on to the presentation. Again, this is the Buddha. This is from a uh, Japanese temple. And depending on where in Asia you are, the Buddha will look different. The Buddha will be fatter, skinnier, taller, shorter, and it really depends on whatever the host culture is, but it's still the Buddha, the beautiful temple uh, in Kamakura, Japan. So some of the objectives and some of the boundaries here. So again, China, Japan are the, I would say the two dominant countries historically, North Korea, South Korea, and Taiwan. It is historically unified by features such as religion, um, the symbology of the languages share some commonality throughout history, and it is politically and ideologically divided. When you think about North and South Korea versus Japan and China, uh, China is a country that is frankly still mostly on the communist side of things, yet they're having to be a part of the globalized economy. So that has some component of capitalism and there's socialism. So it's not as black and white as say when it was the Soviet Union and the United States. It's a little bit of everything at the moment. So makes it frankly complicated. 
Again, from the book perspective, there are your plate boundaries, the Philippine, Pacific, North American, and Eurasian plates. So this is a very tectonically active region. You have big cities like Shanghai, Beijing, Seoul, Tokyo, Hong Kong. And there are other big cities in China, but the further west you go, the smaller those big cities are. This is, of course, the westernmost part of the region, which was, if you recall, included in the Central Asian region as well. So this sort of area here, the Tibetan Plateau and the Taklamakan Desert and the Gobi Desert really kind of belong to all the regions at the moment. So hence my analogy of a wheel and many spokes coming out of it. Uh, some environmental issues, and the environmental issues are obviously always changing. Uh, there's rivers, water is an issue. Um, the 2011 tsunami, which obviously already happened a decade ago, which is kind of scary to even realize, but that had, has some lingering issues in Japan, like for example, uh, pollution, and having to deal with the recovery, which is still, frankly, ongoing. Deforestation in parts of China and rivers and water quality. Um, water is a big deal in China because the majority of the water is here, yet the majority of the population is up here. So you have to, they've, they've taken into account some rather impressive engineering projects to sort of deal with this. We'll get into that a little bit later on. Again, some of the environmental issues. LOESS, L-O-E-S-S. -S, it is a type of glacially deposited sand and dust. It looks very yellowish, and it can be easily moved by the wind. And oftentimes that can find its way into places like, for example, the eastern big cities of China, like Beijing, like Shanghai, like Hong Kong, among a few. Uh, China exports a lot of pollution. They are the biggest emitters of carbon dioxide in the world, just because they are the fastest growing economy in the world. Uh, while China is doing a lot to get into um, alternative energy sources and uses, uh, they still rely quite a bit on coal. That's just still the case. And that's really not going to change anytime soon. You can't simply, they're too big an economy to just simply shut all that off. It's impossible. That can't happen in the United States either, by the way. Uh, so that's... That's what makes the whole climate change fight so complicated. Because if you do shut completely all your fossil fuel sources, your economy would simply collapse. It's just the way that is. Now, how you go about doing that, well, that's a different class altogether. Uh, again, some of the environmental issues. This is what the Three Gorges Dam looks like. It's the biggest dam in the world and it generates quite a bit of electric capacity in addition to reservoir and flood control. That is what it looks like from above, sort of looking at a um, Google Earth type image. There is a different but up close image of it. Again, a really impressive engineering uh, accomplishment. Uh, and it roughly generate about 22 and a half thousand megawatts or 22.5 gigawatts of capacity. Uh, in 1987, the river would have been flowing sort of naturally through the region. And as of 2006, when it was completed, it created this rather large lake and reservoir uh, on the upstream side of it. Any dam has both good and bad sides to it. You can think about a good angle would be clean energy, non-fossil fuel dependent energy. You can think of 
a water reservoir for drought. You can think of it in terms of flood control. Oh, that's good, right? So the bad things would be destruction of cultural sites upstream, uh, environmental disaster in some respects, because you are easy, either wiping out animal species or, or plant species that may have only lived in that area. Um, so you're displacing people because they have to move. If you lived originally here along the banks of the river, well, guess what? That is now underwater. So you have to move. So there is a positive and a negative with doing this. So like anything humans do, it isn't always one way or the other. There's usually some zone of gray in between. Um, there is an $80 billion plus dollar ongoing gamble. It's called the North-South Water Diversion Project. Two phases have been completed, the first in 2013, the second in 2015, and the last phase is estimated to be completed by 2050. So the much more difficult and problematic process. And that is to divert water from the far wetter south into the far drier north. And so one of those is the western one, the one that isn't completed yet. It is way out in much more complicated terrain. Uh, the other two routes have already really addressed the issue of providing water to places like uh, Hangzhou and Shanghai and Beijing uh, and to the east and north of the country. Okay. Uh, other environmental issues. This is what clever humans can do if your terrain isn't good. You adapt by shaping that terrain to suit your needs. And you can basically flood all these little cups that you see here you can grow rice. Some of the other environmental issues, of course, the idea of acid rain and climate change, uh, those two are not necessarily tied together, but they're the biggest exports uh, due to Chinese pollution. And the Chinese have a lot of pollution. Um, again, as of 2007, China decided to map its energy footprint. They do embrace green energy. Uh, there's lots of subsidies for green energy, solar and all that, but, but, and even though they're currently the number one producer of solar capacity, maybe India might be able to catch up to them, but that's about it. Uh, they still rely quite heavily on fossil fuels, coal, natural gas, so. Here's an image from above. The gray that you see there is pollution, nicely banked up by the mountain, so nice and clear on this side, very heavily polluted on that side, whether it be forest fires or any other kind of you know industry or whatever, uh, it is very easily sort of maintained within the region and the terrain. Here's some examples of, you know, you know, the idea of wearing masks was very popular in Asian countries long before COVID, long before it. And this is Tiananmen Square in Beijing. This is the uh, Nest, it's called a 90,000 seat stadium used for the 2008 Olympics, clean day, dirty day. And again, coal fired plants and energy generation. It is the world's worst pollution at the moment. I mean, there are, there are a few places that can approach it. Mexico City, uh, Santiago, Chile would be two, but they don't come close to the level of pollution generated in uh, India. I mean, I'm sorry, in China. India might be another place that has similar pollution problems. Again, this image here is a bit dated already, uh, but it shows you how the energy used in China and how coal and natural gas have 
really become a significant driver, even though a lot of this is taking place. So, and here you can see as of 2000 plus, oh, 2002 or three, look at China's almost meteoric rise in the emission of carbon dioxide, whereas they are now the number one emitter. Undisputed. And again, I had to find a newer image of this just to see how it's changed since. Uh, but this is as of the latest information that I was able to find. Chances are this line is now way up here somewhere. Again, there's a great video, China's Geography Problem, uh, linked on your class page. Here is the actual YouTube address. Uh, definitely worth your while. It's about nine to ten minutes. Let's look at climate. Climate is quite variable. If you go north and east, including northern Japan, Korea, and extreme northeastern China, it's climate like northern Maine, like New England, southern Canada. If you look at the green part, this would be climate like what you find in the United States, Tennessee, Kentucky, that area. Uh, if you go way south, you actually get into tropical climates. And if you go west, very dry. So it's like three different climate zones uh, from very cold and dry and snowy, very wintry to very mild, temperate, almost tropical, to desert-like, not west, okay? Looking at Japan, let's not just focus on China. Japan is an area that is clearly dominated by a history of seismic and volcanic activity. And every one of these little bubbles is an earthquake, whether it be deep or shallow, and you can see how the earthquakes paint the boundaries between individual tectonic plates. Of course, in Japan, the threat is also a tsunami in nature. And the interesting thing about tsunamis is the earthquake can happen in your location and you may be able to experience a tsunami, but that tsunami can travel along the entire Pacific. So in the 1960s, an earthquake that took place in the city of Valdivia, Chile, led to a destructive tsunami in Hawaii and Japan. So it's not necessarily restricted to your location, okay? So again, it is a Japanese term for harbor wave. And it's often the result of the movement of the ocean floor suddenly up. And when that displacing happens, you displace the entire water above it. Okay. So this is an interesting warning tablet, historical marker, marking the highest point that people recorded a tsunami to have gone. So it's almost like a little warning sign saying, if you're below this point, you could experience a tsunami. Anything up from here hasn't, which is sort of a scary, but interesting sort of um, cultural art artifact uh, that is available in many parts of coastal Japan. Uh, Japan, of course, is a an interesting island in that it is very populated, it's very congested, but it has a lot of li uh, lightly populated mountainous regions where they get lots and lots of snow. Uh, it is also um, volcanically active, I just, as you see in that image there with Mount Fuji uh, on the right. In terms of China's physical geography, Northern China is colder, drier, more populated. Southern China is wetter, more tropical, more forested. And notice how it, this roughly breaks up into 
those three climate zones we sort of talked about. Korea, well, Korea is obviously split because of a human issue, the war. And by the way, that war never ended, hasn't ended. Uh, but the further north you go, the more severe the winter climate happens to be because you are basically experiencing winds coming out of Siberia. So it's a very, very cold, harsh climate. In terms of population, hopefully this image is nice and obvious. There's a very distinctive boundary between a heavily populated or densely populated um, China and a very lightly populated China. Here's the issue of population in terms of fertility. Notice everybody is below 2.1. So South Korea, for example, is a country that is shrinking quickly. Um, and so it is a problem in that part of the world. So let's look at Japanese pyramid. Notice a birth rate of 1.4. It is a classic stage five country, meaning shrinking. Notice how successive cohorts are smaller as you get further and further closer to age zero or newborns. Uh, Japanese women live longer than any population on earth. Statistically speaking, if you run into a woman that is of year 95 or older, chances are she's Japanese. So that's how that works. Uh, here is um, Japan in 2050. So Japan, Japan in 2050 is forecast to shrink by about 27 million people from 2010. So that's a significant decrease in population. Here is China in 2021, rapidly aging. And when you look at China, China has probably one of the most bizarre population pyramids of any country because they've had social pro uh, programs in place to limit how many kids people could have. So there you see one child policy started, stopped, started, stopped. And you see this weird double hump to it. Um, they may go up in terms of fertility briefly. So we shall see, but that's a problem. This is a population time bomb into their future. Because for example, the United States is getting older as a country, right? Guess what? So is China. The problem in China is they have a bigger population to begin with. So by the year 2050, and listen to this statistic, China is forecast to have as many retired people as the United States has people, period, which is a staggering statistic. And frankly, from their point of view, it's a scary statistic. Uh, China has this problem. It's called the 421 problem. You have a grandmother, grandfather, grandmother, grandfather. They have a mom and a, and, a, and, a, and a son, male, female, and the only child. So an only child has a set of parents and two sets of grandparents. And that only child now has to, in the future, take care of all six individuals as they get older. So with a looming aging population and fertility rates that are really, really low, people in China and Japan are having to deal with having only one child. And that one child, as he or she grows, is going to be responsible for a larger set of older people to help take care of. And that's a problem. That is a big problem. Again, there is a great, uh, I'm going to try to make this available on the class page. It's called, um, it's a podcast. It's already a little old, but it's a great podcast. 
It came out in 20, um, 2016, but still a really good um, podcast detailing what are some of the problems with this population policy China had. Here's Taiwan with probably the lowest birth rate in the world at 1.05. So in this case, the death rate is clearly greater than the birth rate. So more people are dying that are being born. This isn't because of disease. It's just simply a function of population and fertility habits that have developed in that region. You hear South Korea, great imbalance. And North Korea, eh, it's hard to tell if this data are, are true. I would not buy this graphic, frankly, because we don't really know what the real issue and deal is in North Korea. They don't really share a lot. So this is quite suspect. Here's North Korea and South Korea looked at from space at night. North Korea is basically dark. Compare that to China and South Korea and Japan. Um, there's the city of Beijing. This is um, China's financial capital. This is called the Bund, B-U-N-D. Uh, and so there's a lot of verticality being enacted in these kind of places. Um, Places like this, the, the vertical city, a self-sustaining environment where each of these little sections functions as a city block. As of early 2021, unfortunately, half is empty and it opened in 2016. So there's a cool video here linked as to why it probably should be considered, at least for now, a failure. It's a beautiful building. Like it's a gleaming set of twisting metal and glass with an inside core. And there are hotels and schools and restaurants and shopping centers, but it is mostly empty at the moment, as of 2021, early. So it didn't quite work out as intended. But ask yourself, would you live in a place like this? If you didn't have to leave, you're not forced to stay. Let me just say that. You're not being forced to stay in there. But if you wanted to, you could conduct all your daily activities in this building. Would you do it? Every time I've asked that question, the answer has been mostly no. Uh, I think it's kind of cool, but what would you say? Let's look at urban sprawl. Let me get into the idea of religion and religious diversity. So in places like China, you have, and in South Korea, lots of Christian in, inroads. So you have mega churches like we do in the United States, except it's Korean folks. Uh, Buddhism in a place like Japan and Confucianism in a place like China. Those are the dominant uh, religions in the region. So there's quite a bit of di diversity. Um, there's ethnic diversity as well. And there's also the idea of the love of Western culture, especially in a place like China, Korea, and Japan. Think about the explosion of Korean pop, K-pop, however it's addressed, groups like BTS and all those types. I mean, they may be Korean and they may be speaking in Korean and singing in Korean, but it's borrowed from Western groups. It's exceptionally popular, um, but they cater to American audiences. They've come to things like the Grammys and so on, and they are exceptionally popular, especially with young uh, people. They're, they're very, very heavily influenced by social media. 
And so they've been able to reach a wider audience as a result of that. Baseball is no longer the most popular sport in the United States. It really hasn't been for decades yet. In fact, college football had higher ratings than some of the World Series games uh, in the United States. That's college football, more popular than the World Series and the Major League Baseball playoffs. In Japan, however, baseball is exceptionally popular. It is now culturally ingrained. And going to a baseball game in Japan is actually a lot more fun because they really get into it. Uh, so that's an interesting sort of like export of culture in a global context. The geopolitical framework and the post-war geopolitics. So the issue of what happened after World War II when Japan surrendered and lost the war and what's happened to Japan since, how Korea then split into two and how China's power has evolved over time. So again, let's look at the Korean Peninsula. And there it is, the demilitarized zone. The war never ended. An armistice or a ceasefire was signed in 1953. And as of 2018, heck, I should say as of 2021, it hasn't really ended. There's still a stalemate happening there. This is what the demilitarized zone looks like. You would not want to be caught in here. This is an image from, this is the actual border. This is an American soldier, South Korean soldier, and North Korean soldier. And they stare each other down 24-7, 365 days a week. Uh, as recently as President Trump meeting with um, Kim Jong-un, the North Korean premier, president, dictator, whatever he's called. Uh, Obama came and visited this region as well. So did President Bush and Clinton before him. So it's uh, always a touchy area of the world. And so <clears throat> something that is sort of, sort of gurgles to the top every once in a while, and then it sort of quiets down for a while. I'm going to finish it here with showcasing two places, Macau and Hong Kong. And these two places are now, in fact, Macau has more gambling per capita than Las Vegas. So more gambling takes place here than does in Las Vegas. In Hong Kong, which used to be a, um, a territory of the United Kingdom given back to China or given its sort of independence as it were in 1997, slowly becoming more Chinese and there's been lots of angst and, you know, they would rather be you know, speaking their language, which is Cantonese. And they rather be considered Hong Kong types as opposed to Chinese, very complicated. Lots of protests and general lack of civility going on here. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, hopefully, uh, it's a very really interesting region. If you if you uh, get a chance to watch some of those videos, I highly recommend that you do. Otherwise, if you have any questions, please let me know. Send me an email. Come to the live office hour. And otherwise, I hope you're doing well, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.